In 2007, the EPA dropped a bombshell on the trucking industry. <laughs> New emission standards were coming in 2010, and they were brutal. NOx emissions had to drop from 2.4 grams per brake horsepower hour to just 0.2. That's a 92% reduction. For diesel engine manufacturers, this wasn't just a challenge. It was an existential crisis that would reshape the entire industry. While every other manufacturer scrambled to add complex emission systems to their engines, Navistar made a risky bet that would either revolutionize the diesel industry or destroy the company. Their engineers were convinced they had found a simpler solution, something they called Max Force. They were so confident it would work that they bet the entire company on it, publicly dismissing their competitors' approach as unnecessarily complicated. Engine manufacturers had less than three years to develop, test, and certify completely new emissions control systems. The traditional approach of incremental improvements wouldn't work. This required revolutionary technology that could slash NOx emissions by over 90% while maintaining the power, fuel economy, and reliability that commercial operators demanded. Cummins looked at the numbers and made their choice. Selective catalytic reduction with diesel exhaust fluid. SCR technology would inject a urea solution called DEF into the exhaust stream at precisely controlled rates, converting nitrogen oxides into harmless nitrogen and water through a catalytic reaction. The system required a 20-gallon DEF tank, electronic dosing controls, and regular fluid refills, but Cummins engineers were confident it could meet the stringent standards while preserving engine performance. Detroit Diesel followed the same path, investing heavily in SCR development and partnering with suppliers like Bosch to perfect the injection systems. Caterpillar initially rejected SCR technology for on-highway trucks and instead partnered with Navistar in pursuing the advanced EGR path. However, CAT later exited the North American highway engine market altogether in 2009 rather than adopt SCR. But Navistar's engineers had a radically different idea. Why add all that complexity when you could solve the problem inside the engine itself? Their solution was called Advanced EGR, exhaust gas recirculation cranked up to levels nobody had attempted before. Instead of treating emissions in the exhaust pipe, they would recirculate massive amounts of exhaust gas back into the combustion chamber, lowering peak temperatures and reducing NOx formation at the source. The concept wasn't entirely new. EGR had been used in diesel engines since the 1970s to reduce NOx emissions, but traditional systems recirculated only 5 to 15% of exhaust gas. Navistar's advanced EGR would push that figure to 35 to 40%, levels that required completely redesigning the engine's air handling system, cooling capacity, and combustion strategy. The marketing pitch was brilliant in its simplicity. No DEF, no additional fluids, no extra maintenance headaches for fleet operators. Just a cleaner burning engine that met EPA standards without the after-treatment systems that competitors were scrambling to perfect. Navistar's executives were so confident in their approach that they publicly dismissed SCR technology as unnecessarily complicated and expensive. CEO Dan Ustian became the face of this bold strategy, appearing at industry conferences to tout what he called elegant engineering. He arrogantly predicted that competitors would eventually abandon their complex SCR systems in favor of Navistar's approach once fleet operators experienced the maintenance burden of DEF systems. The company's marketing materials featured side-by-side -side comparisons showing the simple Max Force engine versus competitors' engines surrounded by SCR components, DEF tanks, and associated plumbing. What Navistar didn't advertise was the engineering nightmare required to make advanced EGR work. Having to recirculate a substantial amount of exhaust gas back through the intake system meant that exhaust temperatures of well over 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit were being pumped back into an engine designed to run on fresh air at ambient temperatures. The EGR cooler became the most critical component in the entire system. These massive heat exchangers had to cool superheated exhaust gas from over 1,000 degrees down to a few hundred before it could safely enter the intake manifold. The cooling system, originally designed to handle normal engine temperatures of 180 to 200 degrees Fahrenheit, 
was now tasked with dissipating heat loads that would make a blast furnace operator nervous. Navistar poured hundreds of millions into development and upgraded its Melrose Park, Illinois test and validation campus to support advanced EGR work. The company staffed it with 200 engineers working around the clock to perfect a system that pushed the boundaries of what exhaust gas recirculation could accomplish. The Max Force family spanned multiple displacements from mid-range to heavy duty, each sharing the same advanced EGR architecture with massive coolers and complex recirculation systems that made traditional EGR setups look primitive. The Max Force 13, Navistar's heavy-duty workhorse at 12.4 liters, became the poster child for advanced EGR technology. Producing up to 475 horsepower and 1,700 pound-foot of torque, it featured an EGR system that required extremely high flow rates to achieve compliance. The EGR valve was a substantial electronic unit that required precise control to manage these massive gas flows without disrupting combustion. Navistar used banked NOx credits to sell engines above the 2010 limit through 2011, then relied on the EPA's per-engine non-conformance penalties in 2012 to keep shipping its EGR-only engines until the SCR pivot. The first Max Force engines rolled off the production line in late 2009, and initially everything seemed to be going according to plan. Fleet operators appreciated the apparent simplicity, no DEF tanks to monitor, no additional fluid costs. Navistar's sales team hammered home the message. While competitors were adding expensive, failure-prone after-treatment systems, Max Force engines delivered clean emissions through superior engineering. But by mid-2010, the first cracks began to show, literally. The EGR coolers subjected to severe thermal cycling between the extreme exhaust temperatures and engine coolant temperatures began developing stress fractures at joints and within the core. Even stainless steel construction struggled with the repeated expansion and contraction that occurred every time the engine heated up and cooled down. When an EGR cooler failed, the results were catastrophic and unmistakable. Coolant would leak into the exhaust system, creating massive steam clouds from the tailpipe that looked like a locomotive under full power. Worse, exhaust gas could intrude into the cooling system and drive pressure well beyond normal. The resulting overpressure would blow coolant from the expansion tank, pop radiator caps, and in severe cases, cause secondary damage. The turbochargers were the next domino to fall. Maxforce engines used Garrett variable geometry turbos with electronically controlled actuators to manage the massive exhaust gas recirculation rates. The turbo had to handle not just normal exhaust flow, but also provide the pressure differential needed to drive EGR flow back into the intake against manifold pressure. The extreme temperatures and soot-contaminated exhaust flow proved too much for the precision mechanisms. The turbo actuators, which managed variable vane position, were prone to sticking and subsequent failure from soot contamination, undermining boost control. The carbon deposits formed when unburned hydrocarbons and the recirculated exhaust gas condensed on the cooler actuator surfaces, creating a cement-like buildup that locked the variable geometry mechanism in place. When a turbo failed, it often triggered a cascade of secondary failures. Loss of boost pressure would cause the engine management system to increase fuel injection to maintain power, leading to higher exhaust gas temperatures that would damage the already stressed EGR cooler. The failed turbo would also disrupt the carefully calibrated pressure balance needed for proper EGR flow, causing the system to either over-recirculate exhaust gas and lose power, or under-recirculate and exceed emissions limits. Fleets reported problems that went well beyond isolated parts failures. Some Max Force trucks were triggering active regens every few hundred miles instead of the roughly 800 to 1,000 miles they expected. The diesel particulate filter overwhelmed by the massive soot load from recirculated exhaust gas would clog faster than the passive regeneration system could clean it. During active regens, the DPF could heat to over 1100 degrees Fahrenheit to burn off accumulated soot, but the process was consuming massive amounts of fuel, often around a gallon. The frequent regenerations created their own problems. Drivers reported that their trucks would suddenly lose power and begin belching black smoke as the regeneration system tried to heat the particulate filter. 
The process could take 20 to 30 minutes, during which the truck was essentially unusable for normal operations. Some drivers learned to park in empty lots during regenerations after several incidents, where the superheated exhaust ignited grass or debris near the tailpipe. Oil dilution became another major issue. Frequent active regenerations and late fuel injection for DPF cleaning caused diesel fuel to wash past piston rings and contaminate the oil. This fuel dilution reduced the oil's viscosity from the specified 15W40 grade to something closer to 10W30 after just 5,000 miles, forcing oil change intervals to be cut from 15,000 miles to as little as 5,000 miles. The contaminated oil couldn't properly lubricate critical components like turbocharger bearings, which operated at speeds exceeding 100,000 RPM. Bearing failures became epidemic, with some max force engines requiring turbocharger replacements every 75,000 miles. The cost of a turbocharger replacement, including labor, typically exceeded $4,000, money that fleet operators hadn't budgeted for in their maintenance schedules. The intake manifolds, constructed from aluminum alloy to save weight, began developing cracks around the EGR inlet ports after exposure to the acidic condensation from cooled exhaust gas. The recirculated exhaust contained sulfur compounds that formed sulfuric acid when mixed with water vapor, creating a corrosive environment that attacked the aluminum casting. These hairline fractures would gradually expand under pressure cycling, eventually causing vacuum leaks that triggered rough idle power loss and, in severe cases, complete engine shutdown. By late 2010, the pattern was becoming clear to anyone paying attention. Max Force engines weren't just experiencing isolated component failures, they were suffering from systemic problems caused by pushing EGR technology beyond its practical limits. The complexity that Navistar claimed to have eliminated had simply been moved from the exhaust system into the engine itself, where failures were more expensive and time-consuming to repair. By 2011, the warranty claims were piling up faster than Navistar could process them. The company was spending massive amounts on Max Force related warranty repairs, with some fleets reporting dozens of warranty repairs on small numbers of trucks within just two years of purchase. EGR cooler replacements alone were costing thousands of dollars per incident, and many trucks were experiencing multiple failures. EGR cooler work on the Max Force was time-consuming, but dealers typically serviced or replaced the cooler cores in chassis using updated procedures and special tools. Fleet operators who had bought into Navistar's no death promise were discovering that avoiding one maintenance item had created numerous others. Worse, the failures were unpredictable. A truck could run acceptably for tens of thousands of miles, then suffer a catastrophic EGR cooler failure that left it stranded. The legal trouble started in earnest when major fleets began filing lawsuits. Major litigation included a nationwide class action and fleet cases such as Mylan Supply Chain Solutions and Dutch-made logistics alleging defects and chronic breakdowns in Max Force engines. Some large carriers curtailed or rebalanced purchases away from international during the Max Force troubles, citing uptime and emissions concerns. The message was clear. They had lost confidence in Max Force reliability. The problems weren't limited to large fleets. Owner operators who typically couldn't afford extended downtime were particularly hard hit. Many had purchased international trucks specifically because of Navistar's promise that Max Force engines would be simpler and more reliable than SCR-equipped competitors. Instead, they found themselves facing repair bills that often exceeded their monthly truck payments. The resale market told the brutal truth about Max Force reliability. Used truck dealers reported that international trucks equipped with Max Force engines were selling for substantially less than comparable trucks with Cummins or Detroit engines. Some dealers stopped accepting Max Force-equipped trucks in trade altogether knowing they would sit on their lots while buyers specifically sought out trucks with proven powertrains. Regulatory pressure mounted because Navistar's EGR-only approach could not earn full 2010 NOC certification as credits waned, forcing reliance on EPA's NCP program to keep selling engines. The EPA certified Navistar's engines under a per-engine non-conformance penalty program, while the company lacked full 0.2 grams per horsepower hour 
Knox certification. In June 2012, the DC Circuit struck down the EPA's interim rule. Later that year, the EPA finalized a replacement rule setting penalties up to $3,775 per engine, up from $1,919 under the interim rule. Navistar's engineers made increasingly desperate attempts to salvage the Max Force program. They redesigned EGR coolers with thicker walls and more expensive metallurgy. They modified turbocharger specifications and recalibrated engine software repeatedly. Each fix seemed to solve one problem while creating others. The breaking point came in mid-2012 when Navistar conceded its EGR-only gamble and announced a pivot to SCR. Soon after, offered the Cummins ISX-15 and its flagship ProStar Plus with the first unit shipping in late 2012 and introduced its own SCR-equipped 13-liter N13 in 2013. The financial damage was severe. Navistar's stock price collapsed and credit rating agencies downgraded the company's debt. The company's market share in heavy-duty trucks dropped significantly as customers fled to competitors with proven powertrains. The human cost was equally devastating. Navistar reduced its workforce and closed facilities, including shutting its Garland, Texas plant in 2013, eliminating about 900 jobs, alongside further cost-cutting moves. By 2016, Navistar had retired the Max Force branding and shifted to SCR engines. The engine plants were retooled for other components, and the advanced EGR development programs were terminated. 